Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Metanoia Dallas. We're happy that you're here and you came on a good day or you logged in on a good day because we are starting a series called Faith versus Fear. And the question is simple. Are you making bold moves toward God? That's an important question because sometimes fear has us paralyzed. We're not actually functioning as we should as believers, as people who are a part of the body of Christ. And I know, I know we have a lot we could fear as we read the news, as we look around in society that things are changed. Things have changed. Things are different. Things aren't the way they used to be seven months ago, eight months ago. You know, as, as even we read the news, our president of the United States, um, you know, having COVID-19, some people could begin to start having fear. Maybe, you know, jobs on a decline and, and unemployment had been at an all-time high. Maybe you begin to start having fear. Maybe the fear of actually, you know, your children going back to school. The fact of the matter is there's a lot of things that we can actually fear. But I want to give you a definition of fear, and maybe it can help you a little bit. Uh, fear is simply placing our faith in the what-ifs. So some people say that fear is the opposite of faith. And to a degree, that's right, but it's also faith that is putting our faith in the wrong things. Placing our faith in the what ifs. What if my finances collapse? What if I get sick? What if I send my children to school and something happens? What if? And so we cloud our judgment and our better thinking through letting it being saturated, our minds being saturated with the thought, what if? But what is faith? Well, when we know fear is placing our faith in the what ifs, but when we're talking about biblical faith, what does faith look like? Faith is acting like it is so, even though it's not so so that it might be so, simply because God said so. Basically, God said it, I believe it, and that's it. All throughout the Bible, you can see that stories or you read about God meeting needs. He meets the needs of people, even when he doesn't meet our expectations. Sometimes we have expectations and he don't meet those, but he meets our needs. And because often we don't know what our needs are, we kind of get things confused. I remember growing up, my mom said, boy, I'm going to get you what you need. I'm not going to get you what you want. Anybody grow up hearing that? I'm going to get you what you need. And we didn't know what we needed, right? We thought that was, we thought our wants were our needs. And sometimes that kind of bleeds over into, into adulthood, into being a grown-up. We miss what we need by being consumed by what we want. We've seen numerous of times that Jesus has done so many things, common doubts. He calms doubts. God rewards faith, and ordinary people begin to start slaying giants. Right? We read about things like that. And so when we put our trust in Jesus, we know that God can actually calm those what ifs. Because we have fear of loss. Sometimes we have fear of failure. Many times we also have fear of rejection. Or how about the fear of the unknown, not knowing what to expect? There's a number of things that just seem to be tall and it seems to overwhelm us 
But I have a text, a couple of scriptures I want us to look at. If you have your Bible, if you have an app on your phone or your tablet, if you don't have any of these, we have them on the screen or we have them online for you. But it's Philippians chapter 4. Now, let me give you a little background about Philippians. Philippians is written by a man named Paul. Some would know him as the Apostle Paul. He planted many churches. And so Paul writes a letter. Let me tell you, he writes this letter from being incarcerated. He writes to the church in Philippi. He's locked up, bound by chains. And so while he's locked up, he writes an encouraging letter to, to some people who are stressed out. That's kind of reverse, right? Typically, you would think someone that's incarcerated or locked up, they would need the encouragement. But the Apostle Paul, a giant in the faith, actually writes a letter to a church that's struggling in their faith, a church that's struggling with worries and concerns. And so how he says it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, do not be anxious for anything. That's a good word. That's a good word. He says, do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's good. He says, first of all, what I do not want you to do is be anxious. You know how we have this society that's driven by anxiety, right? And whether it's true or false, you know, it's there. And, and so he, God tells us, don't do that. And then he gives us the recipe of how we shouldn't be anxious and how we shouldn't be overwhelmed. He says, do not be anxious, but this is what you do. But in everything, meaning all situations, every situation. He, so this is building us up to be prayer warriors. This is building us up to stop letting things weigh us down. This is building us up to stop letting problems overwhelm us. He says in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Sometimes we find ourselves presenting our prayers or our petitions and we're not all that thankful about it. Right. You know, have you ever gotten your knees and you really wasn't all thankful about what the things you need to present to God? I have. And so he says, don't be anxious. Pray about everything. And he says, be thankful and present your request to God. Re -re present your request to God. Sometimes we talk about the things we need, right? The requests we have, we call somebody, we text someone, we inbox someone. We start talking about it, right? We don't present it to God. We might start talking to someone else about the request we really have, and we should be presenting to God. But we start talking to somebody else about it. Anybody ever done anything like that? Well, the Apostle Paul was locked up saying, hey, I could be writing you about how these I'm living in these bad conditions. I could be writing you about how this jailer is really treating me bad. I could be writing you and telling you that I'm locked up and I'm really innocent. You know, everybody's innocent when they're locked up, right? No one did anything. You know, you ask him what, what you're in for. He said, come on, man, you know, I didn't do anything. Right. No one done anything. This guy locked up. Right. And so so I could tell you how innocent I am. But he says, this is what I want. I want you to be anxious for nothing. Don't even be anxious for me. Don't even be worried about me. Paul is saying he says, don't even be consumed by me. I know I'm the one to preach the gospel and got you saved. I know I'm the one that planted the church, but don't worry about a thing. Everything's going to be all right. And so he tells him, he says, but this is how you do it. If you don't want to be anxious, you don't want to have an anxiety, you don't want to be worried. He says, what you need to do is you need to pray about everything. All things. He said, do it with a thankful heart. And then look what happens in verse seven. What he says happens when we do this. God does this all throughout the Bible. There's prerequisites, meaning if you do this. God's going to do this, but don't expect him to do this if you don't do this. The prerequisite means that God, God is waiting on us. Many times we're saying we're waiting on God, right? God say, if you remove that out of your life, oh, I might, I might have somebody right now. You know, if, if you remove that out of your life, I may place this in your life. 
And if you do this, I'll do this. He says, if you do not be anxious and pray and you you present all your your petitions and your prayers, if you do that, watch this. Verse seven says this. He said, in the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's good. You know why I like that? Because he says the peace of God that transcends all understanding. I mean, you won't even know why you're at peace. Let me tell you what I mean by peace. Peace does not mean that there's no harm that's going on around you. Peace does not mean there's, there's, there's not problems going on around you. Peace means in the midst of that, you're okay. It don't mean, watch this, because a lot of time we want God to guard our situation. He didn't say he'll guard our situation. He said he'll guard our heart and our mind. He, we want God to guard us from situations. Please don't allow any hardship to come in my life. God said, I never said that. I said, if you go through hardship, I'll make sure that you have peace in your heart and your mind. And I'll guard your heart and your mind. That's what God says. God doesn't say he's going to remove trials. God didn't say he was going to take trials away. As a matter of fact, he says, you know what? You're going to have a lot of them that drive you to your knees. He said, but in the middle of that, I'm going to be right there giving you peace. And it's going to be so peaceful that you won't even understand why you got this peace. And also on top of that, if you do not be anxious, if you pray about everything and you present your request with thanksgiving, if you do these things, what I'm going to do is give you peace. It's going to blow your mind. You're going to be like the emoji with the mind blown out, right? You're going to be like, my God, I don't know why I feel so good about my life, knowing that it's chaos going on around me. Not only are you going to have that, he says, guess what? I'm going to guard your heart and your mind from bitterness. I'm going to guard your heart and your mind from thinking that, you know what, everybody's against me. Have you ever had those thoughts? Come on, let me, let me find somebody. You think everybody talking about you, gossiping about you? Let me, let me find anybody that can understand. You, you start thinking that everybody against you. He said, I'm going to guard your heart and your mind from all that chaotic stuff. If you're not careful... Watch this. Through this text, we learn that God says, I'm going to guard your heart and your mind. I'm not going to guard you from situations. But if we're not careful, we'll produce fear and anxiety in our hearts and our life because we'll expect God to do things he never said he was going to do. Now, let's talk about that. Some of us are getting fearful and anxious and worried because you're expecting God to do something he never said he was going to do. God never said he was going to guard us from situations. God never said he was not going to allow situations and hardship to come in our life. God never said that. So when it happens, all of a sudden we have this spiritual epiphany that it's the devil, right? What if it was God giving us an opportunity to get close to his heart and see how he can give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. What if God was allowing it to happen just so you could plugged into him? You could be, you know, anxious for nothing and, and pray about everything and you could experience this peace that surpasses all understanding. You'll be sitting there with the emoji with the brains blew out, just blown away about how good God is. What if? Sometimes we have what if, but we always have what ifs that are negative. What if my marriage falls apart? What if my child is born with some type of mental deficiency or physical deficiency? What if I'm not able to pay my bills? What if we're always having this what if and filling in the blank with a negativity? What if God would blow your mind? What about that? What if? What creates fear in our life is when we expect God to do something he never said he would do. We're expecting God to do something, and what it does is it creates fear in our hearts because we're, we're not standing on God's word now. We're standing on some opinion or some thought, and it's not biblical. Have you ever sung a song and you really thought that you knew the lyrics? But I mean, you sung it by yourself, though, in the car, and sometimes you're like, 
like, like in, in, in certain, certain areas, you would just like hum through it or something, because you know you don't know what the song is saying, right? Have anybody ever done that? Or is it just me driving around thinking I know? You know, and, and you know you don't know that song. And, and, you, and you learn it. Like that. That's just how, and, and you don't never get it right. I, have, I don't know how many songs I got like that. Old school songs from the 70s. Y'all don't judge me neither. The old Commodore songs, right? The old Earth, Wind, and Fire songs. Don't judge me. Okay, all them songs, I swear them down, I know what it means. I don't know what they're saying. And then you find out what it really meant, right? And you kind of feel like, wow. I'm here to tell you a lot of us are doing that with God's word. Let me tell you, when you learn it wrong, you will live it wrong. See, so, so you, you learn it wrong, so then you live it wrong. And so God never said he was going to guard us from situations. But we'll be like, oh, well, that can't be God because God said, well, where do you say that at? You, you, you fill it in like when we be humming with them songs we don't know. You just fill in the blank. God never said that. And when we begin to expect God to do something he never said he would do, what it does is it creates fear and anxiety. We're going to take a four-week journey on Sundays talking about faith versus fear. Because many of us as Christians are living with fear in our hearts. When we're, we're living with anxiety... We're, we're living with a lot of doubts. We're living with a lot of issues that's crowding our judgment. One of the reasons why, I want to get you to get this, one of the reasons why is we're be, because we're believing for God to do something he never said he would do. We're expecting him to do something he never said he would do. And this is, there's this expectation gap, this expectation gap. What you expect, and then there's a gap between what you really experience. What you expect, and then there's this big old gap, right? Have you ever had that in life? You've, you've, you had some expectations in life, but there's a big gap between what you experienced in life. You didn't get what you expected. And, and what you feel in the blank with is very important. That's the bridge that gets you to the experience that you want in life. Many people throughout the Bible, it tells us that the Bible says that God, what he done so many times throughout the Bible is he met needs. And often it had nothing to do with our expectations. Most of the time it had nothing to do with our expectations. My expectations of God, I'm talking about he's blown my mind because I never expected any of this. Matter of fact, I never had a desire to do any of this. I never had a desire to preach. I know some people that they grew up and their, their great grandfather was a preacher and their grandfather was a preacher and their, their father was a preacher. But I didn't grow up with that. And I never had any intentions of preaching the gospel. That was not my expectation. There was a big gap of what I expected and then what I experienced in life. And oftentimes these things are going on, you know, continuously. How about if you're expecting a particular thing in a relationship? How about if you're expecting a particular thing in your marriage? If you come in expecting things, I'm going to tell you, I came in expecting things in a marriage and it wasn't nothing like what I expected. And that's not, not, not speaking from a negative standpoint, it just wasn't. I thought I knew what marriage was about and God really showed me in about two weeks. It's not what you think, Billy. And that's, it wasn't negative, it's just we, many of us have expectations and we, and we fill in the gap with our, we have expectations, and we fill in that gap with our opinion. We fill in that gap with what we think God should do. Even after we come to Christ, we do this. We fill in that gap with, you know, with our feelings. We, we expect the particular things, we put feelings in there, and then we experience something totally different in life because we didn't put faith. We had a what if. Remember, fear is placing your faith in the what ifs. Faith is acting like it is so, even though it's not so, so that it might be so, 
simply because God said so. God said it. And so someone that has expectations and they're putting faith in Christ, they have expectations and they fill in the blank with God's word. They fill in this blank, this gap with God's word. So they experience the peace of God. They experience a peace of God that surpasses all of their understanding. So, so the bottom line is this, and this is something that is really blowing my mind as I um, learn God's word more and more and more and go deeper into it. What creates fear is a misinterpretation of God's promises. We misunderstand what God said. God didn't say a particular thing, and we begin to start putting faith in basically what we want. Remember, we're, we're, we're going back to when we were kids, remember when we were kids, but it's no different when we come to Christ. When we come to Christ, the Bible says that we are babies in Christ. And being a baby in Christ, sometimes we don't know how, you know, to differentiate a want from a need. And so now we're expecting God to do a particular thing that he never said he would do. Bottom line, get this. If you learn it wrong, you'll live it wrong. And that's why it's so important for us to get plugged in into a place where we can learn the word of God. Tribes are, are something that I challenge everyone to get involved in. Tribe, a tribe is something like a small group where we fellowship, we, we eat on the word of God, you know, and as soon as it, it gets safer, we'll go to coffee shops. Right now we're doing it on Zoom. If you want to join a tribe, just text tribe info to the number 94090 and it'll get you plugged in where there's uh, different tribes. I mean, you got male tribes, you got co-ed tribes, you got female tribes, you got a tribe that you can get plugged in with someone that may be a little bit more mature to you in the word of God or may just be someone that will be a listening ear and they'll get you plugged into God's word. But I'm going to tell you like this, if you learn it wrong, you'll live it wrong. You'll sound like many of us riding down the street singing a song totally wrong. And that's, that's kind of like how it is in, our, in some of our Christian life, right? You know, you, you hear people say stuff, and I'm like, whoa, that, that doesn't line up with God's word. But it sounded good, right? God bless the child who can hold his own. That's not God. That's Tupac. You know, that's not. <laughs> you know, look, think about this. Some people say God would never put you in a situation you can't bear. That's not true either. That's not accurate. God never said that he wouldn't put you in a situation that you couldn't handle it. Matter of fact, God wants to put you in a situation you can't handle it so you can depend on him. Because as long as you can handle it, you, you'll be okay. John chapter 16, verse 33 tells us like this. I have told you these things so that you can have peace. In me. This is Jesus talking. Jesus saying, if you're looking for peace in other places, you won't find it. It's in me. He says, in this world, you will have troubles. Plural. Troubles with an S. Because sometimes we have one trouble and we're like, whew, I endured and I stood on my faith. Oh my God, I'm amazing. You know what? God is good. Amen. And we think like, okay, well, well it, don't worry. You know, I've heard of the situation where uh, typically you're either going into a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. No matter what, you know, storms are always going to come our way, trouble. He says, but be brave. So, so first of all, he tells us that we're going to have trouble, and that's good to know. For all of us that act like trouble is an issue, trouble is your best friend. Trouble actually helps us run to Jesus Christ because many times we won't ever run to Jesus until trouble take place, right? We'll be, we'll be praying them, now lay me down to sleep prayers, right? Until trouble comes, Jesus, I really need you. Now you begin to start praying and crying out from a desperate need and, you know, pursuing God's heart passionately. Trouble. He says, in this world you will have troubles, plural, but be brave, I have defeated the world. The promise here is that you will have trouble. So when we expect not to have trouble, we're expecting something that God never said. 
when trouble come in our life, when we spaz out, we're, we're, we're actually expecting life to be different than God said it was going to be. God never said it was going to be without trouble. And so the promise here is that you will have what? Trouble. If you're not careful, you'll begin to believe things Jesus never said. Jesus never said that. He never said we would not have trouble. He said he will walk with us through them, though. And that's a good thing, that he'll walk with us through our troubles. Many times we uh, will develop fear in our life based on something we shouldn't be afraid of. And so your breakthrough begins in your mind before it manifests in your moment. So if we can press through, you, you know, in our mind, your breakthrough begins in your mind before it manifests in your moment. Many times we want to have chaos in our mind, but to have peace in our moment. But God's saying, first of all, I want to do internal work. And once you have the peace of God that surpass all understanding, then it manifests in your moment. When it's chaos on the inside, numerous, most of the time it's chaos on the outside. And so God wants us to make sure that we can guard our minds. How do we guard our minds? We don't be anxious for nothing, but pray and, and present everything unto the Lord with thanksgiving. God has given us the antidote to overcome our what ifs, our fears, our doubts. It's important to give your entire mind to Christ because one thing he can do is he can do something with a made up mind, but God will not make up your mind for you. And, and so he wants us to give our minds to him, you know, wholeheartedly. He can't do that for us. We have to choose that. And some of us haven't processed our fears and say, or maybe even say that we fear nothing at all. Maybe we haven't even processed that we have fears. The fear of losing a loved one, losing your spouse, losing your child, losing your job, losing. Many of us, we may have the face we have to face our fear of losing or we have to face the fear of failure. Some of us don't want to try anything new because we're scared that we'll fail. So we stay in a safe place. We stay in what's familiar and we won't step out there on faith because we fear that we may fail. And it looks good from a distance. It looks good like, oh, wow, they're, they're pretty consistent. No, they're pretty safe. And consistency is a great thing. I'm not saying change everything up all the time, every day. Consistency can be your best friend as well. But we, you and I as believers, we cannot paralyze ourselves with the fear of failure. Also, we have another fear, the fear of rejection. That, that rejection, we feel like, okay, if I asked her out, maybe she would say no. Well, I heard a statement that was powerful by Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, he said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. My wife says, you have a gift, Billy. I said, what is that? He said, you ask anyone anything. I said, well, I, they can only tell me yes or no. <laughs> and so the fact of the matter is we need to operate in that gift of, of, of learning that, you know what, rejection sometimes can be a blessing, but it's also, you know what, something that we shouldn't fear, though. Also, we should not fear the unknown. We, we have that many times, all right? We fear the unknown. Most of us have children, uh, and, you know, our children, uh, you know, they have a dependency on us, right, you know, to face their fears. M many times if thunderstorm come you know, and, and they hear that loud noise or, or they hear the rain beating up against the house, the child will run into the room to their parents. And as soon as they run into the room, they're OK. They can go back to sleep. It's not that their situation changed. It's just the proximity of them and their parents. They were closer to their parent now. And because of that gap being closed, now they have peace. And that's what God is saying to all of us. God is saying, okay, I ain't going to change your situation. Your situation won't change. But what I do suggest you do is present it to me. Get closer to me. If you can get closer to me, then I can give you peace that surpasses all your understanding. And you know what? And I can guard your heart. 
and your mind. The Bible tells us this in 2 Timothy 1, 7, as I land this plane, we're going to close this up. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Can we say that all together? For God has not given One more time, all together. For Face your fears. Face them head on. Look them in the eye. Convert fears into faith. Because it's already faith already. You're already placing faith, but you're placing faith in your what ifs instead of placing faith in God's word. You're already using that energy already. You might as well use that energy towards believing in God. Whether you're staring down anxiety, pain, guilt, failure, or anything else that feels too big of a battle that you can't win. I'm here to tell you, God said he has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of sound mind. Where did that sound mind come from? It comes from us running to him. And as we run in him, remember God says he'll give us a peace that surpasses all understanding and he'll guard our hearts and our mind. How do we, how do, we do this? How do we face our fears? Well, we've seen in the word of God, one of the things we need to do is we need to learn how to pray. We got to begin to talk to God. What is prayer? Prayer is simply communicating with God. Simple. Talking to God. That's one of the ways we face our fears is prayer. Talking to God about it. And you may say, well, how do I pray? You pray however you want to pray. You know, it, it, it's not about trying to get religious and learning a, a particular prayer. You talk to God the way you talk to him. Because I'm going to talk to him the way I talk to him. Meaning my relationship is personal. You can't you cannot try to, you know, mimic someone else's prayer life. You got to have your own prayer life. So how do you face your fears? You talk to God about your fears. There's nothing wrong with talking to God about your fears. That don't make you a bad person. Actually, that makes you a person that understands that you can't overcome this fear without God. You can't overcome this what if without God. God, you know what? I have this fear and, and Lord, I want to present it to you today because I don't want to run around with this burden. I don't want to run around with this, this anxiety. I don't want to run around with this worry, oh God. And so I just keep on praying. We just keep on praying. He said, well, I tried that. We'll do it again. Right. Well, I've tried praying and it comes back. Well, pray again and again and again. I'm going to tell you, fears, as soon as fear comes to your heart, that's just a clear indicator that it's time to pray and then move forward in faith. Believing that God, I gave you my fear. I don't have it. I don't have it. I'm going to pray and also I'm going to move forward in faith. And then I'm going to have to trust God. Just trust him. Move forward in faith and trust him. Trust that God, he's able to take away your fears. I'm sure we know that God is bigger than any fear that we may have in our hearts. God is bigger than any fear that could ever rise up in our heart. Any worry, any anxiety, God is bigger. God is bigger. And I, and I know I got a room full of people that believe that. So, you know what I'm saying? But God is bigger than any fear. He is. And we got to get that understood in our hearts. So if God is bigger than any of my fears, then why don't I get closer to God? Why don't I want to talk to God about my fears? Why don't I talk to God about my situation? We have to make bold moves toward God. We have to. We have to make bold moves because the enemy is very bold. The devil is bold. He's doing things right in broad daylight, right before our eyes. And we see it day in and day out. Let me tell you, God was bold to reach us. God was so bold that he sent his only son from a holy place. Because of our sins, we couldn't get to God. But because of God's love, he came to us. We couldn't get to heaven because of our sin. We couldn't come to God. So God created his, he created himself into a body, a human body, and came down here on earth, Jesus Christ. He came down here. Now, that was a bold move because he had never experienced sin. He had never been around sin. Everything was holy. He had never been around anything that was negative. He hadn't been around nothing that was impure. 
And even when it would try to, it tried to rise up in Lucifer, it immediately it got cast down out of heaven. Because God is love, that he loved us so much that even though we could not go get to him, he made a bold move and he came to us. Because we couldn't ascend, he descended. Because we couldn't come to God, and because we were enemies of God, he became a friend of man. He laid his life on the line. Some people say that God's son Jesus was killed or he was murdered. I don't believe it. Because if, if he was murdered or killed, that meant that someone took his life. And no one took Jesus' life. Matter of fact, he was so bold about it, Jesus said, you know what, no one will take my life. I'll lay it down and I'll pick it up when I want to. That's a bold statement. That's a powerful statement. God was bold enough to lay down his life because you and I weren't able to get to him. And today we can open up our hearts and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Or we can rededicate our life to the Lord because he made a bold move towards us. But we need to make bold moves towards him to do. We need to make bold moves. What does that move look like? Humbling ourselves. Pressing through the anxiety, pressing through the worries, pressing through the doubt, pressing through our feelings sometimes. Sometimes you just don't feel like getting plugged in with God. But you got to make a bold move and say, you know what, God, I, you made a bold move towards me, so I'm going to make a bold move towards you. I'm going to lift up my hands when I don't want to. I'm going to get on my knees even though they feel a little rusty and, and cranky. and I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get back up. But the fact of the matter is, I'm going to make a bold move towards you because you made a bold move towards me. How many of us know we need to make bold moves toward God and because God made a bold move towards us? If there's anyone here that have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you that God loves you. God loves you so much. God is a God that cares. He cares for each and every last one of us. And so if you're here and you have never accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. And also, it may be a group of people here that may have walked with the Lord, but may have kind of got off track. If you're that person, that's okay. God loves each and every last one of us. He loves us, all of us, as if there was just one of us. And so I'm, I'm here to tell you that Jesus is here making a bold move, and he's knocking at the door of your heart. And he's asking you, can, can he come in? Can I come in? Will you open your heart today? And allow Jesus to come into your heart? Will you open your heart and allow Jesus to become real? Will you open your heart and ask Jesus to forgive you and recommit your life to Christ today? Will you open your heart today and even though you may have accepted Christ, say, God, I still need you because sometimes fear is coming to my life. Fear is coming to my heart and I want to make sure that I put my faith in the right place. I want to act like it is so, even though it's not so. I don't see it yet, God, but I'm going to act like it didn't took place because your word said that you will give me a peace that surpasses all understanding. I need that peace today. I, I need that peace today with every hand lifted, every heart open. Come on now, every, every person in here. You know, we need those who need the peace of God to surpass all understanding. Those who need Jesus Christ. Yeah. This is bad as when they first accepted him. The people that need Jesus desperately like they were when they first got saved. I, I want to pray with you. They just say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I need you. And today, I ask you to come into my life and become real. I need a peace that surpasses all understanding, in Jesus' name, amen.